abardur Vay kömlü You also have um, so there's the other there's the dust down six mm. as well which is to the UK um, and I was kind of I had a background in Chinese studying Chinese that's what I studied at college so I decided to combine music and Chinese and move to China to do music great idea uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and that's where I met um, a another great guitar player from from um, Xinjiang uh, from the northwest part of China uh, whose name is Ekber Ablis and uh, he loved John McLaughlin as well, so we got on very, very well. Um, and we decided to start a band together. Um, and to start off with, we found a tabla player, uh, a Mexican guy who played, tab played tabla. Um, and so we, studied, we had a kind of shakti, but not quite as cool as shakti kind of thing. Um, but the more I was talking to Egbert, I kind of discovered that Uyghur music is mm. something that was really fascinating. It was his music. Um, I wanted to learn more. And, uh, so was he playing Uyghur music at that time? Not so much. Um, we kind of, when we, when we talked at one point, we Skyped with Mahmoud Mehmet, who's um, a, a tambour player from the Xinjiang uh, Music and Dance Ensemble, mm -hmm. and uh, a great friend of Ekber's from childhood. And uh, we kind of, he played the tambour over the Skype, and I, for that moment I was just completely... I just fell in love with it. So and that was your first amazing. time? First time I heard the tamar, yeah, oh, okay. to see the tamar. And it was just, it was a, a moment of, you, I'd listened to a lot of Indian music, I'd listened to a lot of other things, and I was thinking, all this music is, is beautiful, but it doesn't really speak to me. And then Mahmoud was playing over the Skype, and I was just thinking, okay, this is my music, I can, I can go and learn this, okay. that'll be fun to learn.
even the most basic kind of mechanical aspects of this instrument are difficult. Once you've got that, you then have to kind of learn all the different styles of Uyghur music. Uh, so Kashgar has a very particular kind of kind of music, not particularly suited for the tambour on the whole. Um, you can do it, but not, but it, it's difficult. Yeah, basically, the traditions have kind of moved along this, the Silk Road and back again, yeah. and mm. and it's kind of it's just interesting to see how they have come about. Then there's a whole kind of aspect which involves the um, the way that uh, the the Gautuan, the music and dance ensemble, which is a government-based ensemble. Yeah has kind of made the Mukam to be a particular way. Mm. Um, and I think there are good reasons for that, but at the same time, it's, it seems a shame to me that we lose a little bit of exactly, yeah. natural expression. Yeah. So I think, um, so that, that's part of it. It, it. You have to learn the music. You cannot just wing this music. You can't just make this music up. I mean, from what I know, this instrument has many thousands of years of history, I mean, or type music, instruments like this, they have many thousands of, uh, I remember seeing uh, there's a picture of a statue from ancient Greece, mm -hmm. and the top is broken off, but basically it's this instrument. Oh, the same body. And somebody's holding it like this, and playing it like this. <laughs> so everywhere from Greece to, you know, my feeling is that it probably stretches back to Mesopotamian times, you know, the, mm. the times at the beginning of civilization. Mm. Uh, who knows? I mean, it doesn't really matter, but the fact is you're dealing with something which is, which has a tradition, and you can't ignore the tradition when you try and yeah. learn this instrument. If you try and do it your way, you're just going to mess it up. So first learn the tradition, then learn to do what you want to do with it. are so not basic <laughs> um, that, it, that it, it's, it could potentially take up your whole life to do it. I mean, I look at Mahmoud, for example, my teacher, Nur Mahmoud Sun's student, I see this kind of um, patrimony that goes back through the generations. Mm, yeah. um, I learned from Mahmoud, Mahmoud learned from Nur Mahmoud Jan, Nur Mahmoud Jan learned from somebody else, and he learned from somebody else all the way back. So, where at the end of tradition, the most you can really expect to achieve with it is to add a little bit of your own flavour to yeah. it, your own purak to it. Um, 
if you can do that, then you've really achieved something. But that's a, a lifetime's work. Um, I'm a guitar player as well, and I have a day job. So, you know, I'm never going to do that. But what I will be able to do is to play uh, some parts of Wigan music pretty well authentically. Mm -hmm. so, I think what was interesting for me as well was to see how great musicians were playing in crappy places because they just didn't have any opportunity to do anything more. And it made me ask myself why it is that such great musicians don't get the exposure that I thought they, they completely deserved. I mean, there are some amazing musicians in that place. Uh, when you listen to them playing, you can it's, it's, a, it's a wonder of technique married to emotion. Yeah. <laughs> and you can see the way that people react to it. It's just, it's so deeply buried in, in, in every Uyghur soul, the, the, the music. to completely define the emotions that people feel or to help them to a particular part. You go to a, a rock concert with 20,000 people or whatever, you've got a wall of speakers like this, mm -hmm. and the only emotion that they can get out of you really is kind of a form of mass hysteria. You know, it's where everybody is just like, ah, you know, completely going crazy. Um, music should be able to do more than that, I think. Yeah. Um, and that's that's definitely what Uyghur music taught me is that there is there are dynamics, there are ways, there are tempos, there are things that that you can change, which completely alter the experience of listening to the music. And I think that's that's a it's hugely true. valuable piece of. Thing. You know, I I don't find it's ever very difficult to communicate with musicians wherever they come from. It's there. We all speak a, a variation of the same language in the end. So, um, I mean, I think. Uh, I mean, the very basics of it, Mahmoud spoke Chinese, so I could speak Chinese, that was fine. Um, and he would tell me if something was important or not, generally by smacking me over the back of the head. <laughs> um, and so, you know, these are the things. You realize that he, sometimes it's difficult to understand why something is not correct. Mm, um, true. So the Panchit Amukam, the first uh, Dastan Mehul, for example, he always used to criticize me about it because he said, it's not right. I was like, okay, so how is it not right? And, uh, you know, we're speaking the same language, but he, he's saying, it's just not right. It's not, not right. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a big culture shock as well. It's the different way of playing, of learning music. Mm. Um, with Mahmoud, he would play me a phrase once, a four-bar phrase once, and I, he would expect me to play it back to him. Um, and when I got to that, then he would start on the eight-bar phrases. <laughs> So you had to have a really good ear. Um, uh, to learn some of the Mukam things, uh, I mean, literally he would play. And say, okay, you go. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, from a musical point of view, the, the point of view of just kind of having to use my ears properly, mm. instead of just saying, oh yeah, I kind of got it. Oh, we'll work it out over three or four attempts. Yeah. That wasn't good enough for Mahmoud. You learned it at the first attempt. Mm. Uh, honestly, you got his mark. It was to study that your ear and your muscle memory are powerful tools, mm. um, and that you need to rely on them to help you to do these processes. You can't. You can't wing or, or, or your music. You can't just kind of turn up and say, "Yeah, I kind of know the Mukam a little bit, but mm -hmm. let's play with this tune." You can't do that. You have to know it really, really well. Mm -hmm. um, now that's something that's very present in jazz music, but it's not very present in many other musics. Mm -hmm. I don't think. <laughs> Oh, 
Shock. It was just a wonderful experience to be in 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 Urumqi, then Kashgar, then in Hulja. Um, I we drove through the mountains back from Hulja back to Urumqi mm. up to about four thousand meters of height. I was trying to light a cigarette a cigarette up there, <laughs> and the flame was entirely blue because there wasn't enough oxygen to, to really light it. Uh, and just to see the sky, the stars kind of painted across the sky. You know, I mean, mm. it's just there's just nothing in between you and the stars. You at that altitude. There are rocks falling off in front of you. You're never quite sure whether you're going to make it. And you're not, never sure whether you have quite enough petrol to get to, to get you to where you need to be. Uh, it's an adventure. Everything about it was an adventure. I'm a, a British guy from the southeast of England, where nothing really much ever happens. And suddenly, I was in a place where, honestly, if if aliens had landed in front of me, I wouldn't have been surprised. <laughs> <laughs> Why you are? Why you are? 